Welcome to RoboHub. For this episode, we flew out to Denver, Colorado and spoke to Joe Castaneri, head of AI at Amprobotics. I don't think people understand the immense scale of trash that materials recovery facilities called MRFs go through. A typical MRF goes through 25 tons of trash per hour. It's unbelievable that this is still done by people. AMP is making it abundantly clear this is a job for robots. What got you started at uh, Amp Robotics? I was 19, studying applied math at CU Boulder, uh, and uh, the founder, Matanya Horowitz, the company had kind of just started maybe uh, a year before, and it had been trying to prove the concept of just sorting anything through NSF, National Science Foundation grants. Um, and I think the first prototype was a uh, a uh, Xbox Connect sensor looking at his desk oh, with wow. trash on it and using a, an SVM to, to <laughs> suit basic classification. And that got him the grant, and then he spun that grant into other grants and had a very small group of people just trying to get it off the ground. So he, yeah. he came to see you farming for interns uh, yeah. because part of the grant money allotted it intern cash. And so we were all kind of got to see this presentation about robots and recycling. And I distinctly remember thinking, that's super cool, but yeah. not for me. I'm not into trash. <laughs> and then a couple months later, I realized I didn't have a plan for the, for my summer. You know, you're yeah. trying to get your internship lined up. I woke up in a cold sweat. It's like, what am I going to do? And I remembered that uh, talk. And I was like, oh, God, better email him. Yeah. And I cold emailed him four months later and uh, have worked here ever since. That was in uh, 2016. Okay. 2016. So I did actually three internships uh, as a student, and uh, I was studying applied math. I adjusted kind of my, my the focus of my master's degree to be in statistical modeling and and closer to uh, what was quickly emerging as deep learning. And you know, 2014 with AlexNet really coming into fruition, you have more co coursework available for yeah. for deep learning, but plenty in statistical modeling. Uh, got my master's degree in applied math and then started full time as a machine learning engineer here in 2019, um, once we were like 20 people or so. Oh, that's interesting. So actually the company started with AI. We weren't uh, classical uh, first. In fact, Matanya as the founder, he got a uh, robotics path planning degree at Caltech. Yeah. And uh, started this company right after. And really what he was looking for were, hey, we have these immense problems societally in the green tech space. I'm seeing what robots can do enabled by massive improvements in GPU technology and yeah. the emergence of deep learning. How can I apply that and robotics to a green tech problem? So very much in the formative part of the company was this fusion of robotics, AI, and green tech problems. Yeah. And, and he came to recycling as a good application for it. And so also, you know, with advances in GPU, were you mm -hmm. guys doing cloud first? So you guys were um, doing the processing on the robots themselves? Sure. So a very simple answer is uh, trash facilities have bad internet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so especially early on when we just have our little unit. It's got a computer there. Yeah. Uh, because you're doing live robotics as well, you have a combination of trash facilities that have bad internet and you have a hard latency requirement. You've got to yeah. be live. And so we have been doing edge computing the whole time. Uh, we've grown at the beginning. You, so you have your online inference that is edge. But you have a lot of support infrastructure to ultimately build, evaluate, and deliver those models that, uh, you know, supporting infrastructure you're not doing that on the edge, uh, do that some centralized place. When you're a company of six people, it's on some extra gaming PC that's in the corner, yeah. and then you graduate from that, you might have an actual server in the corner. But at a certain point, we graduated to Google Cloud, uh, who provides very uh, compelling credits for tech startups hmm. to use so that when you're in that position where you might have revenue, like you might have yeah. a unit, you're proving a concept, you can't afford a true GPU cloud bill, but you can use Google Cloud Platform through through these credits until the credits run out, at which point, assumedly, you've kind of proved something. Yeah. And so we started putting our support infrastructure in Google Cloud at that time. So how did you get from like the early stages of where you guys were to where yeah. you are now? Uh, by listening and uh, a fair degree of, of brain damage that we were receptive to, right? So... Whenever you have a product that you are targeting some problem with, yeah. uh, you 
take a product oriented mindset and you customer interview and really try to make sure that you're solving a real problem. But your work begins once that hits the field. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the most compelling period of growth for us going from zero fleet units to 20. Mm -hmm. And every single unit between zero and 20 was dramatically different than the one that came before. And at that time, you do things that don't scale very well. You hand wire everything. Everything is hand wired differently than everything else. Um, and it has to be because you're iterating so quickly. Yeah the you know, almost luxury of really good version control on your hardware documentation. Yeah. It's not something you have time for yet because you're chasing value. Yeah. And you find that the value proposition that you initially pursued, it, uh, if you were right in your value proposition, doesn't break, but it will bend as, as you encounter the real problems that make delivering that value difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's a philosophical answer to your question, but really it was just getting robots in the field and watching how they broke and seeing what made the particular deployed circumstances of AI and robotics in a recycling facility environment, which is very harsh, yeah. uh, what made that problem special and difficult and how we could adjust our platform to be robust to it. And then, you know, add features to our platform that uh, were reactive to the, the needs uh, yeah. of those, those systems. The first places that we saw this being used like really well is places that have a lot of order, right? Yes. And then that's like the opposite totally. of the environment that AMP works in. You totally. guys are working with Murphs, you guys are working with recycling facilities. So the objects that are coming down, it's cans, it's bottles, it's deformed bottles, it's dirty bottles. Right. You know, like what's the range of objects that you're seeing? It's huge. If you think about a milk jug, it's made out of natural high density polyethylene a plump milk jug that's not deformed at all. Yeah. It could just be crushed. It could be completely flattened, but worse still, it could be a scrap of that plastic that no longer looks like a milk jug anymore. So yeah. you're running kind of the whole gambit of variation between something that is very visually distinct to something that is very visually non-distinct and, yeah. and, and blurry. And that is why classical computer vision techniques don't work in an application like computer vision and recycling because you have too much variation of what you're looking at. You can't possibly think of all the cases that I have to program in myself. What is good for humanity, I suppose, is that deep learning models seem to be able to do that. If you provide enough data that says, hey, I've, I've got 300,000 milk jugs for you to look at, and they look so different from each other mm -hmm. across that gambit of examples, but the one thing in common that these 300,000 things have is that they're a milk jug. I'm going to show each of them to you and grade you on your ability to see that the milk jugginess of this milk jug turns out it is able to perform well enough to actually be useful in an industrial context. Yeah, the other wrench in this is that milk jugs are made of different materials. Right? Sure. Well, you have the plastic ones, you have yeah. the cardboard covered in a film mm -hmm. uh, totally. types that you see, and then you have all sorts of marketing materials on top of it that can you know, mislead you, right? Like yeah. you can see pictures of cows on, on two milk jugs and they could be totally unrelated things. Like how does the AI separate that? So if you can be taught the difference, it can be taught mm -hmm. with a sufficient number of examples. If uh, a visual rule that, hey, uh, this type of branding, even though the, the form factor of this object looks like what you'd normally think is natural high density polyethylene, we happen to know this brand is polypropylene. Mm -hmm. um, if I can explain oh. that to you, and you can consistently do it by hand, if human sorters can do it, with consistent data annotation, people can do it too. This does raise an operational complexity, though. That kind of means you have to be able to maintain these things over yeah. time, right? Packaging is changing. Packaging should change, not only for marketing, but to make it easier to recycle, yeah. uh, and as new products come on the market. So those weird nuanced things that we are baking into this training data set we use yeah. to train the models, they change over time. And yeah. so one of the conclusions AMP has come to is that you really do need to invest in the uh, iteration and continual improvement yeah. of AI in this space because of its variability. You, there's not a, you're never really done with the model. You're only yeah. done against this problem for now. Yeah, this is an industry where model drift becomes uh, very, very significant. Yes, good uh, way of 
concisely putting it. Totally agree. So, and then here behind you, we have the this uh, not a prototype, but like a in assembly model. Yes. So this is our uh, flagship Cortex product, where uh, we have a Delta style robot that will overhang over a belt. The belt will go from where I am through here. Uh, this unit in particular, we're in our production floor where we manufacture the units. We assemble uh, the robots that are Omron robots. We uh, integrate with Omron and then we custom design the pneumatics and the wiring, the frame, the vision cabinet that is running that edge compute. Um, and we bring it all together into one package. So yeah. this one is in process of manufacturing and will go out into a recycling facility over a conveyor belt. Yeah, so this is uh, actually a, a five or six year old prototype called Claudia. Yeah. Uh, so to explain, you have a suction cup gripper here and a, a beefy spring so that the variable height of the material or condition of the material is absorbed mechanically. Mm. Um, and then a pneumatic system uh, going through uh, this particular gripper. And the suction cup will form a vacuum seal and we descend, suck, and then place off the side of the belt into a chute or, or yeah. into a bunker. So then this right here would be where, say, a milk jug would come and it would hold on to that milk jug. Yes. With the air suction. And in particular, a head of the robot cell, a camera imaging the conveyor belt, will look at the material, localize where it is and what it is, mm -hmm. and then the robotic path planning software will say, okay, I am configured to pick these things, so mm -hmm. let me subset down what I've seen to what I'm configured to pick. And then, oh, there, there are too many things to pick that I have time for. What uh, I want to optimize the number of things that I can pick given how long they're going to be in my picking region. And then I will intercept to be at this location at this time and turn my vacuum on at this time yeah. and then place it off the side of the belt. Yeah, so I, the interesting thing here is that this is a moving belt. You've it's got a limited belt. amount of time yeah. and you're trying to hit a certain number of items per minute that yes. you're picking. Yes, right? in particular, the value proposition of these units is as a replacement for human sorters. Yeah. And so human sorters will remove material at 30 to 50 picks per minute in a, at their peak. And so a, a decent starting robot will uh, remove material at uh, 30 to 50 picks per minute to break even with a person, but really you, you'd like it to do better. And so these systems routinely hit 80 plus picks per minute. Yeah. We've seen them hit over 100 if the material stream is perfectly providing you a lot of eligible options in a well spread out way. Yeah. So a lot faster than a person at a higher purity and for the whole duration of, you know, two shifts a day. And how, so how does that change from, say, one facility to another, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, are, they, are these used in different ways by different companies? Dramatically, yes. There's always a, a conveyor belt in a facility that's the last chance conveyor. And it's yeah. the very last one. It's your last chance to get any stuff on that conveyor or it's going to go to landfill. And this is a frustrating thing to consumers because you figure you put it in your recycling bin, it's all going to be recycled. And the reality is it'll be passed through this facility and whatever the yield of that facility is, we're going to pull that out. The rest goes to landfill. And so our early applications were to put these units on last chance lines and, hey, get whatever you can. But a different type of application for these might be you have other conventional sorting equipment that is separating 2D paper and cardboard from 3D containers and plastics. And you have all this paper and cardboard, but because it was sorted conventionally, there are a whole bunch of other things in there. And so you would quality control remove stuff out of that stream. Historically, this has been done by people. Yeah. Um, if it's not done, then the paper bales that you make might be rejected by the buyer. There's too much plastic in there, too many impurities. So it has to be done to ensure that the product you're making, paper in this case, yeah. has any value. And these can be there to quality control that stream. Is it a mixture of literally everything that people put into their uh, recycling bin is now yeah. what arrives at the MRF? And now you have to separate out each individual component. So it would be like you're separating out the paper, the plastic, the cans, and then the random trash that people threw in there as well. That's exactly right. I'd go one step further. If you think about the waste stream, like a miner thinks about ore, what do you have in there? You've got precious metals, you've got hydrocarbons, you've got a lot of uh, paper products, you've got wood products in there. The problem is, is they're, they're not refined, right? Mm -hmm. If you can sort them, you add value, right? It's, it's trash, it's literally trash, mm -hmm. until we can 
uh, sort it, and now it's suddenly valuable. This is a feedstock now. It's no longer trash. It's transformed into an input to an industry. Um, and so when people are throwing stuff in the recycling bin, uh, they will wish cycle uh, things, which is, oh, I bet they'll find a use for this. Yeah. <laughs> and it will roll up to a recycling facility and literally be dumped in a massive pile of, of recycling, and a front loader will take a scoop of it and put it into the system. The first conveyor belt in the system is called the pre-sort line. It's usually a really wide, super rugged conveyor belt with hand sorters pulling off bicycles. People, yes. And this is, uh, this is people still because it's a difficult grasping problem uh, because the things that are removing are things that are really weird and shouldn't be there. Stuff like bowling balls, uh, dog, dog doo-doo bags, <laughs> Uh, literal yes. bicycles, uh, mattresses are very common. Things that will break machinery down the line. So you get all of that out, and now your conventional sorting equipment can sort through it. How does a mattress get into a recycling can? Uh, well, the recycling <laughs> dumpsters in cities is typically how. Yeah. At least in my building, I live in like a condo unit, so we have a dumpster for garbage, and we do have a, a dumpster for single stream recycling. And people will well-meaningly put their old Ikea lamp in there mm. because it has metal in it. And yeah, surely they'll find a way to, to recycle this. The problem is that uh, since waste is so abstracted away from us as everyday yeah. consumers, we think that maybe they're going to disassemble the lamp. They have to run at 25 tons an hour for these facilities to be profitable. They don't have time to disassemble that lamp. Yeah. That lamp is actually standing in the way of them running efficiently. 25 tons an hour. That's very common for a, a, a Denver municipal. We're in Denver, so yeah. uh, municipal facilities in Denver might process 25 tons an hour. Uh, wow. So 50,000 pounds an hour of material. And do you know offhand what, how much trash a person produces, uh, say, in a year? I think what I've heard is a family household will produce like three tons where about one ton is recycling, something yeah. like that. So this is a massive scale. It's a massive scale. And, it, you, you know, trash is produced locally, so you need these facilities locally. They're called municipal recycling facilities because they're often grant-funded through municipalities to support uh, the population there. Yeah. Um, and so because of that, you also have a massive amount of variation. No city is the same. So yeah. you'll have, and Denver's a fairly big city, so a 25-ton-per-hour facility for recycling makes sense. Uh, we're in Colorado. If you go into the Rocky Mountains, uh, very rare to be able to recycle at all because there's simply not enough volume to make it profitable. That's something we're actually very concerned about at, at AMP. Why is there not recycling in more rural areas, uh, in areas that don't have the uh, population to drive, you know, 10 tons to 30 tons an hour of waste? Because you need to run enough volume for the business to be profitable. Mm. It's a, it's a narrow margin, so you need a lot of scale yeah. for that narrow margin to pay for your fixed costs. Wouldn't it be great if you could have a smaller capital expense to build a smaller facility that was profitable without requiring so much throughput? And that, yeah. that, that's another thing that we're very concerned with at AMP. Yeah. So, you know, what are those fixed costs that are yeah. preventing people? So the fixed costs for a facility are the capital equipment, the sortation equipment. Conveyor belts themselves, if you go into these facilities, it is a maze of conveyor belts yeah. transferring up and around the whole facility. Uh, forgetting the capital equipment uh, completely, the conveyor belts themselves are a, a big expense. Yeah. It's common for uh, that 25 ton per hour example, that facility might cost 10 to $20 million uh, to build, which uh, if you know, you're in the mining industry is not much, but if yeah. you're in anything else is a lot. Um, and so since projects are really live or die by their ROI and the margin is thin on recycling, it can be hard to justify that $20 million. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so to answer your question, it's the sortation equipment and it's the conveyor belts. There are also a lot of dynamic costs. Um, the dynamic costs, if you are a smaller player, you actually have to source your material in. You might be paying for the material that you are sorting hmm. um, and that can come at a cost. If you're somebody like waste management that runs the uh, transport of the material, you vertically integrate away that yeah. cost. 
And then the other big cost is freight. Uh, like I said before, we all make trash, so that's kind of nice. Uh, you centrally locate your trash processing, and surely the surrounding area can be your generator of waste. But if you, uh, if you need more, you might have to freight it in. And then if you are selling uh, the finished goods, the sorted paper, sorted PET bottles, whatever commodity it is, uh, there's a freight cost associated with shipping yeah. it out that is actually quite large. Yeah. So, you know, when you're dealing with the industry where the margins are tight, yeah. right, how much is it affected by changes in material prices and like who, you know, who the yeah. buyers are? And I imagine even per city and per region of the U.S., the, yeah. the, the prices that you would pay for certain materials would be very different. It's hugely impactful. Uh, two examples for you. Uh, in 2018, China stopped low-grade plastics from the U.S. They used to take and pay for low-grade plastics, which for operators in the United States was great because they have these low-grade plastics they can't sell in the U.S., and instead of having to pay to landfill them, they can get some small amount of money uh, by selling them to China. And then China just stopped taking them. Hugely disruptive yeah. to all of the recycling industry because now suddenly we... Uh, for the immediate term, have to pay to landfill these low-grade plastics. And then medium long-term, boy, we got to find a way to use these that is allowing us to not pay the negative financial cost of landfilling yeah. them, let alone the negative green cost of landfilling this material. And yeah. so that actually led to a lot of innovation uh, in the space, you know. And low-grade plastic, so does that include uh, bottles? Or is that generally things like plastic bags and uh, other like these lower cost or degradable Good question. So um, the big four commodities in recycling, the things that make the revenue for recyclers are aluminum cans, mm -hmm. cardboard, PET drinking water bottles, so number one, and uh, milk jugs, and HDPE. Mm -hmm. There are other things as well, uh, colored HDPE, think Tide containers, uh, those are a, a good commodity. Uh, polypropylene, uh, which is tubs, lids, yogurt tubs and lids and other things, is, is sold valuably. But those four are the things that uh, are of most value. Yeah. Why? Because there's an offtake for them where we can get, make use of them. Yeah. Uh, we're able to sort cardboard well due to its density and its 2D structure. And so a whole industry is, has built up around the processing of cardboard. Uh, same thing for aluminum cans where, yeah, if you have an eddy current that uh, electromagnetically pulls off the aluminum and then you QC the aluminum that's not the beverage can alloy, you can remelt that down and make new cans. And this is with like the traditional... Traditional equipment. Sorting totally. Yeah. Um, but for something like polystyrene, which is... Uh, red Solo cups are made out of polystyrene. It's a very common, brittle plastic. It's cheap. And so it's used a lot. Um it's a difficult, it's, it's a highly varied material type. So it's difficult to sort it consistently. And then B, because of that, nobody has a use for it yet. And so it's very cheap. The opportunity cost of picking a red Solo cup and letting a PET bottle go by is high enough that if you go to a recycling facility on that last chance line where everything else is going to go to landfill, if you don't see it picked, you know what you see? Lots of red Solo cups. And so these low-grade plastics that China stopped taking was a lot of the non-big four commodities, polystyrene, different types of film, mixed plastics that weren't the valuable single resin uh, sorted types that uh, currently have offtakes available for them. Yeah. So when China stopped taking them, a good thing that starts happening is that the industry has a pressure on it to find a good use mm -hmm. for these plastics, which requires finding a good way to sort those plastics so that a good use can be made of them. Yeah. And so you see different chemical conversion techniques like pyrolysis and methanolysis coming online that can accept polystyrene and different types of film as an intake, uh, which is very exciting because it increases how much we're recycling and just decreases what we're burying in the ground. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, with the big four that you guys are picking that are the, the, the cash sure. Cash crops, the cash garbage, crops right? of, of garbage. I love um, that. Yeah. So for those ones, uh, is that what your algorithms are mostly trained on, and that's like where, you know, not not only is there detection, but there's like this higher level trade off of like value to time logic that you guys right. have going on. So of course we have an incentive to be really good at 
seeing and sorting the cash crops of garbage. Yeah. Um, but one of the disruptive powers of AI robotics and recycling is that we're also good at the materials that normally are ignored. And so we are part of that solution if you're trying to take a plastic that doesn't have a place to go. And, well, it doesn't have a place to go because there's not really a way to sort it because conventional sortation doesn't work for it. AI sortation does. We're perfectly good at, at seeing polystyrene rigid, which is a low-grade plastic um, that is not normally recycled. We're quite good at seeing it. And so one of the exciting things about this technology entering into the industry is that it will enable and already is enabling uh, increased recycling of goods that historically wouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. Now, we are really good at seeing yeah. uh, the cash crops of recycling out of need because the robots, as we started as a company retrofitting value into existing facilities. So um, if you're retrofitting value, you got to meet those facilities where they are and what are they sorting. They're sorting natural high density polyethylene, PET bottles, cardboard, and aluminum, amongst yeah. other things. And, you know, because this is something where the MRF is picking what they can sell, right? Yeah. They're picking what their local customers are willing to buy for them. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some materials that they just, you know, it's not a value, valuable to them to pick. Right. So would they be able to just go through the software and just say, like, hey, these are the ones I care about. Everything else. Just let it go. Yes. Uh, they, they can, with a few clicks, configure what the robot is going to pick if halfway through the day. They say, uh, you know what, I do want to pick this thing off the belt because I noticed there's more of it in the load I just dumped into the front of the facility. A few clicks, and now we're pulling that off as well. Um, likewise, the other way around, they might say, you know, it's, it's letting too much of my cash crop PET bottle go by, and it's getting too much of the paper I don't care about. I'm going to up the priority on the, on the uh, cash crop PET. So they're highly configurable in an environment where traditional sortation equipment, because it's mechanical, is easy to operate, it's reliable, but it's not reconfigurable yeah. unless you have a wrench and some downtime. Yeah. Uh, so these are highly reconfigurable. And in uh, our facilities where we run all of our systems using AI as the, as the, the backbone that's driving all of the recognition, yeah. we will, for example, change the uh, type of material that we're putting in and we'll just click a button, reconfigure the entire plant to pick uh, according to the new material that we just put into the facility. Yeah, yeah that's powerful. You know, like you, you can imagine when you have something that's operated by people also, mm -hmm. uh, how many items can you tell them to keep in their mind to look out for? Exactly. At once, right? Yeah, it's, right. There, there's a limit and there's switching costs to saying like, right. all right, switch to this now, switch to that. Also, you know, you, you get in the zone, you probably be annoyed at being told to just switch and do something else. Totally. Um, so, yeah, I mean, has that like unlocked something for your customers? It has. Uh, on the topic of, of hand sorters, I, I think hand sorting is a perfect example of a dull, dirty and dangerous job. Yeah. Uh, dangerous because uh, there actually are things like hypodermic needles and pathogenic substances in the garbage. So they wear big gloves, they wear masks. There's a lot of uh, dust in the air that's not great to breathe. It's dull because you're standing by the side of a conveyor belt picking trash all day, and it's dirty because it is trash. Um, yeah. So it's kind of a perfect, dull, dirty, dangerous job to automate. And in our value proposition selling these robots, it's dual-sided. Uh, you get to replace the labor costs uh, with this robot, and it will produce revenue by picking things. And that's what gives them a sub-two-year return on investment for, for a unit like this. Oh, interesting. Um, is how we, we want to price them and place them in the facility to maximize that return, right? Yeah. And we often see that that uh, is a good rule of thumb. But the there are a lot of hidden costs with human sorters. You brought up it's difficult for a person to keep, you know, 32 things in mind. They're going to pick the milk jugs and the PET bottles, and that's about it. You can't uh, ask them to do too many things at once, or uh, they won't be able to do the cash crop ones at all. Yeah. With AI software, that's not a limitation at all. Um, the other costs that are a bit hidden is uh, there are different statistics on this depending on where you are. Some municipalities are really good at retention. I've often seen it cited that a median tenure for a hand sorter is uh, three to six weeks, right? <laughs> so imagine operating a facility where you're trying to make sure that you're not losing out on revenue by not having that station filled 
but the average tenure is three to six weeks. Yeah. You are paying extra costs, like the opportunity cost of lost revenue when uh, somebody doesn't show up for their shift. Yeah. You have a marketing budget to attract new talent. You have a training budget to train that new talent. Uh, and then you, of course, have the normal budget of uh, actually having hand sorters on, on payroll. So it's very expensive to recycling facilities to have a lot of hand sorting. Um, and so it ends up being incredibly valuable to, to automate it if you can. That's one emergent value that comes from the automation for the customers. Uh, but there are others as well. Yeah, yeah. So how, uh, how prevalent are you guys uh, with MRFs in America? Our biggest market is United States primary sortation. We've installed more than 300 units uh, in our facilities and in retrofit facilities uh, that are operated by customers as well. Most of those are in the United States. We do have a small presence in Canada, in Japan, in the EU as well. Um, so we are uh, international. Uh, same problems exist yeah. in different markets. Uh, the EU has more uh, regulatory pressure for solutions. So you see stricter purity constraints around the, the goods that you're sorting. And what's that range? Is it like 95 percent? Um, when we make bales of material, so big cubes of plastic, we sell them to a plastics reclaimer or somebody who's going to process that material and turn it into a, a recycled plastic feedstock. Yeah. Um, whether that bale is good enough kind of comes down to whether they hit the yield they were hoping to. If they didn't hit the yield, then the bale was bad because we, up till now, have not known what is in the bale. Mm. We think it's about this pure, but that's plus or minus 20% maybe. Uh, a rule of thumb has been for plastic spills, you want them to be 85% plus pure. For aluminum cans, uh, you want them to be more like 97 plus percent pure. Um, and uh, so you'll need more processing to achieve that. The reality is that recycling historically has been doing best effort and providing these feedstocks to downstream processes that can hopefully do their conversion process with the quality of material they receive. Yeah. Um, EU is tightening regulations by uh, requiring that more is recycled. So we talked about low quality plastics before. Um, they're requiring films are recycled at higher and higher rates, even though they're not in the Americas. So not even just recycling more of the cans and more of right. the bottles, but recycling more materials. More, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And so you want to hit both sides of that. Yeah. But, you know, how can you... How can you start recycling more materials until you have the buyer side of the, the equation sorted? Like, is that right. is that sorted for them already? Like, hey, we already have the customers to pay for it. Um, and then make sure. it make sense for the merch. Part of it is, and uh, since we've got several chains, who's the buyer for you? Um, so what I'm understanding the buyer is, it's who is buying the, the, the packed material yeah. from the merch. Yes, totally. Yeah, so... The, uh, the buyer side would like more, more than anything an open market with pricing of these different commodities at different known grades of quality so that you can transparently price them and buy them to sustain the volume they need to run their chemical operation. Yeah. And that information right now doesn't exist. Um, it's very much a contract by contract basis uh, market where you're a buyer in this area of the country, you're going to buy from specific partners that you know through your history provide good enough material for you. So it's a very word of mouth yeah. kind of partnership based setup, yeah. um, which limits its scalability. Yeah. If you had a marketplace where you had kind of certified grades on different plastic commodities and recycling commodities in general, more entrants would be able to come in and say, okay, I can I can make something valuable out of that feedstock yeah. that nobody else is doing because I know how to access it. I don't require a lot of personal relationships to get into that market. Do you even have like a very good way of determining the yield of each bale? You, uh, depends on the, the, the process. Uh, some processes, generally you do, because if you think about aluminum cans, you'll weigh the bale before you put it into your, your post-processing facility now. And then they'll remove contaminants again, usually, uh, with an eddy current. And then they'll melt it down. And now you can weigh that at the end. And that is just a mass yield. And that's typically available. 
Um, we, on our side, yield is much the same. We'll have the raw material from either curbside or whatever infeed that we're putting into the sorting facility, and then we can sum up the mass of what we are uh, actually produced and the mass that's going to landfill detracts from yield. So we typically have pretty good yield numbers through this process. They're just very zoomed out to the yeah. whole operation. Um, with analytics, with AI being able to tell you not only go to this location and pick at this time to remove this thing, but also things like, I have seen this many aluminum cans in the last 15 seconds, and there are 40 cameras in this facility doing the same thing. Suddenly you have an emergent uh, introspection in that facility where you can dive more deeply into, hey, what is the yield of this unit? How efficient is this piece of capital equipment that is part of my facility and drive fundamentally better efficiency that way? Yeah, so that's interesting. That's another big differentiator from uh, uh, a place that doesn't yeah. have this system in place because right. it sounds like one of the biggest challenges in waste is uh, not having access to good data. Yes. Right? And then this is actually giving you a stream of data. Right. Live, totally. Um, that you guys can also continue to use for training and continue to use for classification. Right. Moving forward. Yes. Yeah, so it's the, the data is obviously valuable to us for that reason. We can, uh, as the waste stream shifts, we can shift the AI to keep up with the waste stream. But to your point, uh, we run our own facilities. And, and like I, I mentioned, they'll have dozens of vision systems running at all points of the recycling facility. So versus having, you know, if you had three robots in your facility, you have kind of three points where you can see, here's the composition of material here. It's a high day, it's a low day. I can do some basic discovery there to help improve my operation surely. But what if you design a facility around the key idea that we can use perception to drive efficiency? Yeah. Well, now you put those cameras everywhere and you build, design the facility around the, the, the cameras themselves and the way that we're sorting material using those vision stacks. And now you really, really can drive efficiency in a way that you simply can't in existing facility models. So smart AI-driven facilities will fundamentally yield higher than existing facilities. They will yield a higher variability of material that before now has not even been recyclable, and they'll do so consistently. Uh, because they can notify operators when different things are going wrong rather than forcing operators into a reactive posture yeah. where they wait till the problem happens. So, you know, if you were to imagine just the smallest version of the system yeah. you know, for the smallest municipality, totally. Um, what would that look like? Right. A cool image in our head would be like a shipping container that the side opens and you have a conveyor belt that you just shovel on stuff. And then you would have uh, a pneumatic-based optical sorter uh, is what they're called in the industry. They have valves where a conveyor belt ends, and those valves are going to fire a puff of air to hit a, an object up or won't fire, and that object will fall through down. And so there are two conveyor belts it could land on. There's an up one, and then it just passes through to a down one. And so you could imagine a very simple setup where you just have a, a, a recirculating conveyor belt going around, and we're gonna sort up this commodity to the upper belt, get it se separated. Okay, reconfigure to the next one. Okay, reconfigure to the next one. Uh, that would be a really, really, really basic idea yeah. that you could uh, drop in in front of, a, for example, you know, a, a music festival where a lot of waste is produced. It's temporary. You separate out the materials and then you can uh, just put it back on the semi truck and tow it away. Yeah. For a rural community, you might do something between that and what we have in a, in a full-scale recycling facility. So this is uh, you know, basically uh, a humanless operation. Uh, it's basically, you right. just have to have somebody load or a truck right. load the, the trash and then yeah. um, after that, take it. Yes. Somebody loads and somebody removes. Yeah. Uh, and then that same, it's probably the same somebody and then that same somebody configures as well. Yeah. Awesome. Um, that's the dream. Yeah. Let's go take a look at the, the robot. Totally. Nice.